Good morning and welcome to Marco Presbyterian Church. This morning we will read the word, sing the word, pray the word, and hear the word being preached and respond to God's word. Our prayer is that the truth of Jesus will bring hope to your heart and transform our minds. Last week, Scott shared the ABCs of Godly Mother from Proverbs 31. Because God adores, blesses, and covers her, a godly woman serves God, her husband, her children, and her community. This week, Steve will share one day in the life of Jesus from Matthew 9. When you and I love like Jesus, we are fulfilling the mission of the church, bringing hope to people with the truth of Jesus. Don't forget to make plans to attend the installation service for Pastor Scott and Steve on June 13th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Vacation Bible School registration is open at markochurch.com. So parents, register your kindergartner through fifth grader today, and VBS will take place from July 26th through the 30th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. On June 6th, we will be starting a new series called the Psalms of Summer and walking through how these beautiful songs from God's Word help us to honor Him in all seasons of life. Do you have a favorite psalm or a verse from a psalm? Email your favorite to gene at gene at markochurch.com and she will be using these submissions throughout the series and let's help encourage one another by sharing the words of God that have encouraged you through every season of life. Finally we want to know you're in the service this morning so download the NPC app and venture to connect tab and you'll find a connect card there that you can fill out and let us know that you're in the service this morning. There are many other opportunities to connect, grow, and serve here at NPC so check out markochurch.com or the Marco Church app for more information about these events and more. Have a great Sunday. Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? It's great to see your smiling faces, and we're here to worship Jesus this morning. So if you'll stand with me, I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 1, and we'll see where we fit into the story, where we get to look at Jesus and know more about Him as we approach Him in worship this morning. So I'll read from Hebrews chapter 1, just the first couple of verses, which say, Long ago, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're grateful that we can approach your throne with grace this morning, throne of grace with confidence uh, through Christ. And so we do pray that as we pray the word, sing the word, preach the word, and respond to the word, that in fact, Father, you would, by your spirit, transform us more and more into the word, which is Jesus. Father, we pray that you would be glorified this morning. Would you receive our worship? And again, Father, we pray that you change us for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
praying for a few different things, including many of you who are traveling. We know that some of you are headed back up north. We'll be praying for you and for the many things that are happening at this church during the summer. Even though it's summertime, we keep going. Let's pray. Our Father, we acknowledge that we can, again, approach your throne of grace with confidence only through Christ. And we know that even as we need you, we come to you in the, in the form or through Jesus. You see us through your Son, Jesus. And so we can be assured that you receive our repentance, our prayers, and Father, because of your Son, Jesus, as well, you continue to give us your grace even today. And so, Father, we look to you. We need you. We pray that you would continue to be glorified in us and through us and our different uh, people who are leaving now, uh, members of our body, friends and family who are going up north. We pray that you would keep them safe Father, we pray that you'd supply them with their needs, all the way from gasoline to time with family. Father, would you refresh them as they go north and bring them back to us 
safely uh, at, uh, at the end of this summer. Father, we do pray too for the many who are in need physically and emotionally and spiritually. We pray for uh, Jerry as he's recovering from surgery on his knee. We pray that you'd give him what he needs to uh, do physical therapy. Father, would you ease his pain? We pray for Linda Sanders as well. We pray for Bruce Hillenbrand and uh, Father, for others who are suffering. We pray that you'd give them healing that comes by knowing you and by resting in you alone. Father, we I also do pray for uh, the different things coming up, including our celebration of installing both uh, Pastor Steve and myself. We pray that you'd bless our families and your church. We pray, that, Father, you would even now prepare the hearts and minds of the children who will come to Vacation Bible School. We pray, God, that you would use this as an opportunity to preach Christ on this island and in East Naples. We pray that you'd be glorified as we serve our kids, our families. We too pray for that student ministry retreat that will happen in July, that you would bless them as they go away. Father, we're so grateful for the way that you've provided for our needs, and we do pray now that you would continue to provide uh, for our needs. We read in 2 Corinthians in chapter 9 that the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Father, we pray that you would use these tithes and offerings that are given uh, cheerfully. And uh, Father, we pray that you would use them for your glory, the expansion of your kingdom. Would you support your kingdom work around the world and on this island? Would you, Father, be glorified as we seek to love others well? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I did just pray as well for the tithes and offerings that we'll, uh, we will all give. There are different ways to give here. We'll also be passing uh, the baskets around. And uh, what we want to do, what we hope that God would do through us and in us, is to continue to transform us and to communicate the hope that we have in us on this island. I'm going to take some time and sing to the um, king about... Uh... Jesus and what a wonderful mystery he is to us sometimes, um, but he's also our king, and to ha today we are going to sing some praises to him, so sing this with me. Come be all the wondrous mystery in the dark.
we thank you this morning because you came for us. You sacrificed yourself on the cross so that we could have relationship with you, so that we have a hope to look forward to, that this world is not all that's left for us, that we get to spend eternity dwelling with you forever. And so thank you, Father, for helping us to open our eyes and our hearts this morning to what you have for us that you would speak to us, that we would not leave this, we would not leave this place the same as when we came, but that you would transform our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm in Matthew chapter 9, and if you'd like to be in Matthew 9, that would be great. I got four verses that I think you're going to really appreciate. Matthew chapter 9, as you're finding that, I want to remind you that over the last few weeks, Scott and I have been keenly focused on calling you to love like Jesus. Why would we do that? The reason that we're focused on that is because... It is our mission that drives us here at Marco, and our mission is to bring hope to people with the truth of Jesus. And you may look at that mission and say, well, that sounds great. How do I do it? Well, that's what I'm going to try and tell you this morning. One way that you could be personally involved in that mission is to love like Jesus. So to say it in a different way, when you and I go out into this community, and all the spheres of influence that you and I have, when you and I love like Jesus, we are bringing them hope. So what I want to try and do this morning is I want to give you a glimpse into a typical day in the life of Jesus. I'm going to construct a day in the life of Jesus, and then next Sunday I want to do just six hours in the life of Jesus. So if your Bibles are open to Matthew 9, I want to start reading to you at verse 35. So let's stand. Matthew chapter 9, 35, 36, 37, and 38. This is the Word of God. Matthew 9, 35, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction when Jesus saw the, notice the word, crowds, plural, crowds. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Well, some of you have heard through the grapevine that this past week my lawnmower broke. Now, that engine would crank, I'm telling you, it would crank, but it would not start. Now, as you know, for an engine to run, it needs three things. It needs a spark. 
it needs fuel, and it needs compression. So I got out my handy socket wrench, removed the spark plug. To me, it looked pretty good. I cleaned it up, took some steel wool on the contacts, made sure the gap was right, reinserted the spark plug, cranked it over, and it would not start. So I thought, okay, fuel. Well, the fuel wasn't that old, and the gas I could see was flowing to the filter, and it appeared to be flowing to the carburetor, so I thought, can't be the gas. So then I got to thinking about compression, which led me to think, oh, that's right. An engine has lungs, just like you and I do. It's got to breathe. And so I checked the air filter. Well, I want you to just hold that thought for a moment. We're going to come back to my air filter just a little later. But for now, I want to keep my promise to give you a typical day in the life of Jesus. And how am I going to go about that? Well, I'm going to let Matthew tell me how to do that so you know where I got this from. You see, what we're going to find is here's a typical day in the life of Jesus. And what has moved me this week is everywhere he goes, he's just loving people. So that if you and I would imitate Jesus, we could be about the mission that he wants us to be on here and right around the world. So let's look at a typical day. And the way Matthew lays it out in verse 35, he tells us where Jesus went. And then in verse 36, he tells us what Jesus saw. And then in verses 37 and 38, Matthew tells us what Jesus said which would be much like the way you and I carry on a conversation. I mean, I've got my cycling friend down here, Scott. I might say to him, what'd you do yesterday? Well, I know some of what he did yesterday because we cycled together, but he's going to tell me where he went. He's going to tell me what he saw, and he's going to tell me what he said. That's just the way we talk about our day. And so Matthew's made this really simple, where Jesus went, what he saw, and what he said. So let that kind of uh, a profile stay in your mind as I take apart a day in the life of Jesus. And the first truth that I find is that it was love that motivated Jesus to bring hope everywhere he went. Now, Jesus didn't have a private jet. He didn't have a car. He didn't even have a bike. He walked. And where did he walk? Well, verse 35 tells you he went to every city he could, and he went to every village he could in that region. And they estimate that Jesus probably covered about 3,100 miles in three years, spending as much time as he could with people. The Gospels record sometimes it was a quick conversation. Sometimes it was hours. But we also know that in some cases, Jesus spent days with people, just loving people loving, loving people all day long, everywhere he went. Now, I have to tell you that when I wrote that paragraph, it made me want to just slow down for a minute to ask myself, what's really going on here? What what is love about? And so this is what I want to have in your mind for a few moments. Love is actually a choice you and I make. And it's not one choice, it's not ten choices, it's literally hundreds and thousands, if not over a lifetime, millions of choices, tiny steps, baby steps, little things, just to love over the course of a day, a week, a month, and your lifetime. In other words, there's no such thing as falling out of love. What happens is you simply make thousands of little choices to no longer love. But not Jesus. He spent three years loving every single person he came into to contact with. Now, you may have heard the ridiculous story of the husband and wife whose marriage was really struggling. In fact, to be honest, it was crumbling. Every day things got worse. So the wife, as is often the case, says, to her husband, we, we got to go see a counselor. He didn't want to. Anyway, he, he finally gets dragged off by her to see this counselor, and they sit down, and the counselor said, how can I help you? Well, the wife jumps in and says, he never tells me that he loves me. 
Well, the husband so far has not uttered a word. But now he jumps in and he says, what are you talking about? I told you that I loved you the day we were married. Now, I wrote this message on the day that the news reported that Bill and Melinda Gates announced their divorce. And you wonder what led to that. Well, for most of us, it's either a choice of hundreds and thousands of millions of steps to keep loving or to not love. Any working relationship involves countless choices to love or, or not to love. Now, I recognize that true love consists sometimes of great acts of love. But the truth is, true love is mostly a whole big pile of little choices just to keep loving, morning, afternoon, and evening. So to love like Jesus means that you and I need to stand back and view every day as an opportunity to simply make that choice to love everybody that I come into contact with. So my point is this, everywhere Jesus went, verse 35, he loved. Question, do you? Secondly, love motivated Jesus to see people's deeper needs. Now, Matthew has told us in verse 35 that Jesus went city by city, village by village, and spent all this time with people. Next, Matthew tells us what Jesus saw. And it says there in, in 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, what did he see? Now, Jesus didn't just merely observe surface details. Verse 36 tells us that as he looked at the crowds, he saw the people, notice the language, that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then what happens? As he's staring at these people, as he's taking in the data of their lives, verse 36 says he had compassion on them. Now, compassion is a deep, deep word, and I want to get into it a little bit later. But I only learned this week that com compassion is the most frequently referred to emotion of the Lord Jesus. More than any other emotion, he had compassion. He had compassion on, on these people. So, as he looks at you right now, are you aware that he has compassion for you? Jesus is looking beyond your style of dress, your facial features, the way you primped and got your hair just right this morning. He's looking beyond your career and your failures and your successes. He sees you as you are and has compassion for you. Now, you know we often use the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. Now, I make a lot of mistakes, and that's a mistake I often make. I judge a book by its cover. If you were here last Sunday, you will remember that Scott told us a funny story about some mischief that he got into when he was just a young boy. Now, as Scott was telling us that, we, last week, I'm looking up at Scott, you know, and he presents as uh, this well-dressed, uh, educated, uh, middle-class guy, and of course he is. But uh, as Scott now knows, every time I look at him, I'm going to picture him spray-painting a stop sign turquoise blue. So don't judge a book by its, by its cover. Now, the other thing that was going through my mind as Scott brought that to us last week is I was grateful that I didn't grow up with Scott because if the two of us had been young boys together, there's no telling the mischief we may have gotten into because don't judge a book by its cover. I stand up here. My shirt is perfectly pressed, if you don't mind me saying. I think my hair is still roughly in place. I did trim my beard before I got here. I always check to make sure my socks match. But don't judge a book by its cover. 
Because when I was a young boy, two weeks after Christmas one year, I said to my best friend Danny, let's go through the whole neighborhood and let's gather up all the dead Christmas trees that we can find. And let's make a massive pile of all these dead Christmas trees in the middle of this country road and all light the match. Well, I did. And we ran for our lives. I can still feel that. You see, I thought we'd just have a nice little campfire. We had an absolute inferno with sparks rising into the sky. I have not told that story for 40 years because I don't know how many people knew who was involved at that time. Don't judge a book by its cover. You see, Jesus is looking right inside of you right now. Beyond the shine, beyond the polish, behind the smiling face, middle-class manners, cultural behaviors, is the real you. And while you're capable of fooling a few people, you can't fool Jesus. He both sees you and loves you. He's looking right at you right now. He knows who you really are and what's going on for Jesus. The emotion of compassion is oozing out of him for you this, this very second. You see, what does he see? What does he see in me? What does he see in you? You see, as he was looking at the crowds, we know what he saw. He was looking beyond the externals and seeing people who were harassed and helpless like sheep with no shepherd. And he may be doing that with you right now. You see, if you don't have Jesus as your shepherd, you're harassed and helpless like a sheep with no shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, says Psalm 23. If Jesus is your shepherd, you're not harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. You know he's going to take care of you, right? But if you don't have that, Jesus sees it. I can't. I wish I could because I'd nestle up beside you and talk to you. But that doesn't matter. He sees you. You see, he knows his sheep by name. By name. So to love like Jesus means you and I need to get the best eyes we can to see people as they really are. They're either lost or they're found. And you and I need to have eyes to begin to see that and then have compassion for them. So the point is simple. Everywhere Jesus went, verse 35, he saw, verse 36, he saw people as either lost or found. Do you? Thirdly, love motivated Jesus to build a global community of hope givers. 35 tells us where he went. 36 tells us what he saw. And now Jesus begins to speak. And Matthew gives us a recording, so to speak. I mean, I would love to have been there when Jesus was wandering around, but we kind of get it right here. What did he actually say? Well, you see what he said. Verse 37, he said to his disciples, his followers, the harvest is plentiful. Now, here's Jesus, the God-man, who could only cover a limited area. If it was 3,100 miles, that's a fair, fair distance, but nothing great compared to the mileage you and I can cover now. But he was limited. He could only go to a certain number of villages and a certain number of cities in the three years that he was here. And up ahead, he was looking and seeing his suffering, his cross, his resurrection, and his ascension to return to his Father. So the time had come to multiply exponentially his love. Jesus is the greatest leader that has ever walked this earth. And he knew that he now had to hand it over to you and me. He handed it over to the greatest organization that has ever been on the earth, and that's the Church of Jesus. Millions upon millions of his followers, of which you and I are a part. And so the greatest leader in the world hands the greatest organization in the world the task to spread hope 
everywhere we go because he's not here now. In other words, he was envisioning millions of Christians spreading love and covering the globe. Listen again to what he said. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, some of you know I cycle most days to work, and I come up Bald Eagle, and I love the new Sherwin-Williams uh, building we've got here on our, our island. And they've got it all painted up, and their vans are all painted up pretty, and they've got this logo. I don't know how many years they've had this as their logo, but I kind of like it. There you've got the globe, and you've got this, this uh, gallon of, uh, of red paint upside down covering the globe. And that's exactly what it says, cover the earth. I kind of wish we'd grab that logo before they did, because that really is our mission. It really, I look at that globe and I think, well, paint is not our product, but hope is our product. And we ought to take a gallon of, of hope and just pour it over the whole globe. That's what you and I are supposed to do. We're to imitate Jesus. Now, you know the phrase. You grew up with the phrase. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. If you imitate Jesus, if you love like Jesus, then you're honoring him, which is your purpose for being on this planet. One of the jobs uh, that I took to get us through seminary back when I was young was to drive school bus in Philadelphia. Now, I can still remember when I landed that job, I walked into the office and they did not throw me a set of keys. They did not say, Steve, your bus is the fourth one out the back in the pothole-filled parking lot in Philly. No. They assigned me to a driver. So I got in the seat behind the driver, and this lady kindly taught me about driving a bus. First, how to get out of the parking lot, because literally it was pothole-filled. And she said, the first thing you're going to do is take a mirror off the bus if you're not careful. She showed me how to do that. She showed me my prescribed route. She showed me how to pick up kids and drop kids off and hopefully lose nobody in the process. Now, what was I to do? I was to imitate the person who knew what they were doing. That, that was my job, imitate. And I don't think I lost any kids over that period of time. And that's what you're to do. You are to imitate Jesus, he's the only one to, to, to really love correctly. Now, some of you who uh, are dying to hear about my lawnmower, I want to take you back there. I told you already I checked the spark plug. I checked the fuel. I'm down to the air filter. Air filter is kind of like the lungs. And sure enough, that poor old air filter was clogged with dust and dirt. In fact, to do an experiment, I actually dropped it on my garage floor, and you wouldn't believe the amount of dirt that came out of that thing. In other words, I'm telling you, I hadn't changed that air filter for seven and a half years. That's the truth, you see. So, it was its problem. It was clogged. It couldn't breathe. It was clogged up so badly that my mower was rendered ineffective, broken, me frustrated, and my lawn unmowed. Now, I look at a typical day in the life of Jesus, and what I'm seeing are millions upon millions of choices that he made to love others. He went, he saw, he said. So simple. So Jesus has prescribed a way to love the world like he loved the cities and villages that he visited. And that's what he's saying to you, and that's what he's saying to me. He's saying, let's get out into the harvest and love and bring hope to people. It's so simple. That's what he wants us to do. So I'm sitting there looking at my lawnmower. Now, I occasionally wipe it down, you know. It, it looks pretty good. You can come by and see it. It doesn't look too bad, but what struck me was that my mower looked fine. All the parts were there. And all the parts were in their proper places. The engine and the blades and the tires and the ignition and the fuel looked great. But so what? It wasn't running. It was not running. Now, as I look at Jesus' church, 
what strikes me is that we look just fine. All the parts are in place. We have one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever been on. We have resources, we have good leaders, we have good staff, we have good plans, we have goals, we have policies in place. I'm not sure that we are getting the grass cut, so to speak. I wonder if Jesus' church is clogged up like my air filter. You see, Jesus tells us that the harvest is plentiful. But are we seeing a harvest? You see, I drive up to Lowe's, and I walk down the aisle, and I ask the guy, where am I going to get an air filter for my mower? Right here, okay? $14.95, and I'm back home, and uh, I put that thing on there. I wish you could have been there. I cranked this thing over, and it started. <laughs> I mean, I was the happiest guy on the island. It started. I literally just stood there and listened. It was purring, at least in my opinion, it was purring. You see, I was so pleased. One little detail. And that thing would not start. Now everything was working. I can't wait to run it again this week. You see, Jesus is telling Marco Presbyterian Church that the harvest is ripe. What does that mean? That means the harvest exists. It means it's now. It means it's real. I have to tell myself that so often. It's not in doubt. In fact, God is promising a larger harvest than we could fit in this room. He's promising a larger harvest than we could fit in every church building in southwest Florida. But I wonder if, like my mower, you and I are just a little clogged up. Maybe we're clogged up with blindness. I think sometimes I've been blind. I only learned this statistic this week, that over 40 times the gospel writers, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, wrote that Jesus looked. If every word is inspired, and we know it is, the word looked comes from the Holy Spirit. He wanted me to see that. He wanted you to see that Jesus looked intentionally, deliberately, he looked. You see, looking is risky, though, isn't it? That's the problem with looking. I'd rather have my blinders on and just go through the day. Looking is risky. Looking will shape your heart. But closing our eyes to people clogs up the system. Are you clogged up with blindness? You know, some of us are clogged up with self-centeredness. We just want to do our own thing. We don't want to mess with people's needs. Quite frankly, messing with people's needs is messy. We want to just take care of ourselves. That's enough for most of us. And as a result, our hearts get clogged up through blindness, through self-centeredness. Or maybe, you know, after the last 14, 15 months, we're clogged up with a critical spirit. We're sure we're right. Our job is to straighten everybody else out. But you know, the problem with adopting a critical attitude toward everything is you don't have any time for compassion. And do you know that compassion is good for you? It's actually good for you. It affects you deeply. You see, the problem with judging other people is it's really a knee-jerk reaction. It's really very simple to judge people. It takes little thought. It's quick. Whereas compassion is just the opposite. Compassion is slow. It's a little bit like that dial on your oven where you just put it on simmer. Criticism is boiling, but compassion is just slow. It's thought-filled. It does take effort. There's a saying in Africa that goes this way, slowly by slowly. I need to memorize that. That's what compassion is, just slowly by slowly. One, thousand, a million choices to love. We look and we look again and we start to see beyond the surface and our hearts are moved, our emotions are engaged, and compassion is stirred up by the Holy Spirit, and we start to love and love and love and love. And what we find is it's so freeing. <laughs> We're out of bondage. 
we're into it now. This is, this is fun. We love our world. We love our island. We love our region. It's a little bit like Sherwin-Williams. We start covering the globe. How about you? How about your heart? Do you find that your heart is clogged up so you won't look at people as they really are? Is your heart clogged up so you won't love people like Jesus did? Is your heart clogged up so you won't say, I am going to obey verses 37 and 38? Now I guarantee you that if this afternoon you go home and read verses 37 and 38 and pray that, he'll answer that prayer. I promise you he will. He's never let me down when I've asked, where do you want me? You see, to be very specific, and I had someone thank me for doing this list, so I I hope you won't mind. I remind you that even here in this church are dozens of wonderful ways to love like Jesus, because as COVID lifts, and aren't we happy about that, the world opens up before us again, and so we get a fresh start. God has, at least in our lifetime, never given us such a fresh start to start over. And really get out there and love people. How about Vacation Bible School? Wasn't Katie great when she was just giving us a little picture? And I don't know about you, but everywhere I go on the island, in the time we've been here, I have never seen so many young children. It's wonderful. Our island has radically changed. And so through Vacation Bible School, we can imitate Jesus. Our Stephen ministry, you heard Cindy talk. Wasn't she convincing? I'm sitting there thinking... Maybe I ought to be a Stephen minister. What a great way to love. We have daily bread. That's a great way. Our prayer team, our missions team, our nursing home. Our own mission in Atlanta has set a goal to obey verses 37 and 38. And as a result, they're going to ask the Lord to give them 192 I have that correct. I checked it out. 192 new cities around the world that they've never reached before. That that sounds so massive to me. I can't get into it. But that's the goal, the prayer goal. 192 new cities and 29 new university campuses. And don't we want to reach university students as we do through Lucas and Bobby Lee Tanner? Are there people in your condo? who are harassed and helpless like sheep with no shepherd? Are there people in your neighborhood, your country club, your yacht club, people at Walmart and Publix and Winn-Dixie, on the golf course, your evening walks, who if you could see inside, they're harassed and helpless if Jesus is not their shepherd. So let's ask the Lord of the harvest to send us out to love like Jesus. Let's pray. So, Father, as I often say, we're going to need a lot of help to love like you do. Forgive us when we don't, and help us to do it today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we have, um, we have read the word, we have prayed the word, we've heard the word being preached, and now we have this wonderful opportunity to respond to God's word. And um, the song that we're going to respond with is usually done as a call to worship. Um, But the reason I picked it is because I feel like we are supposed to, we are called to worship with our whole lives, all the time, not just on Sunday morning. And it's also a song of thanksgiving. And what it's based off of is the Old Testament, the New Testament, all these different scriptures. It comes out of the Bible directly, all of this um, song. But one of the scriptures that they used is this one, and I think it's really appropriate. It says, it's Romans 5, 2, that says, Through him, Jesus, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And that's what we get to invite people to be a part of. And then we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So would you stand and let's sing rejoicing as we leave today so that we have hope in our hearts to invite people to be a part of this wonderful grace we have found. Shifting shadows 
good word, I want to read a psalm to you. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? All the time, says Jim. Glad you're back with us. Is he your shepherd? It could be that you've come here this morning and you'd be willing to be honest enough to say, yeah, I am harassed and helpless like a sheep with no shepherd. If he's your shepherd, what would you say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But if he's not your shepherd, you have many, many needs that are going unmet. But it could be that you're a person who likes coming to church or comes to church out of habit, but you've never asked Jesus to be your personal shepherd. And maybe today would be a good day to do that. I know you'll have excuses for not doing that, but none of your excuses are very good, quite frankly. There's nothing wrong with May the 16th, 2021, to say, Lord Jesus, I've been going to church for years, but I've never asked you to be my shepherd. And you could simply do that by saying, I know I'm a sinner. I got a lot of sins that need to be forgiven. I'd like a fresh start. There are times I'm harassed and helpless like a sheep with no shepherd. Would you come and be my good shepherd now? And you know what he'll do? He's already oozing with compassion for you. And he'll show you compassion so good that you'll say with the psalmist, he makes me lie down in green pastures. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. That's much better than the choices I'd make for his name's sake. In fact, it can get so bad that you could say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you, my shepherd, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And if Jesus is your shepherd, you will say, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For how long? Forever. May God bless you.